All right, everybody, welcome to the Mark series, part 39. We're going to be talking about pastoral abuses, among other things, but really we're focused on this section in Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45, where Jesus is teaching the thing that I think would stop pastoral abuses. I want to give us a understanding of this passage verse by verse, because that's what this is. This is part of the Mark series. If you're interested in following with me through the entire gospel of Mark, the long and thoughtful study through the Gospel of Mark dealing with theology, apologetics, verse-by-verse -verse teaching. There's a link in the description to the playlist that will give you the whole series. Um, but today, let me give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover. So not only Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45, but also a supposed contradiction. Some say that there's a contradiction in this passage. And uh, it, I don't always cover these because it would take up a lot of time to deal with all the supposed contradictions. But I'm going to deal with one today. I also want us to understand this passage in context, that when we look at this with the overall flow of Mark, we'll see that this issue of pastoral abuse is not only a character problem amongst many pastors when they're being abusive in a variety of fashions, but, and there's hope for you, if that's you, you can change. And I want to give you that hope today. But also this ac attitude and the actions of abusive pastors is it's bigger than just the, the single action of abuse. It shows that they're misunderstanding the very nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus labored so hard to change our view of because of the false expectations they had about the Messiah, the, the things that led to that and that leads even modern Jews, many to reject Jesus are the same things that lead pastors as they move into leadership to slowly become worldly in the way that they lead the church. And so we're going to deal with that today in the uh, in the Mark series. Thanks for joining. Thank you for those who are coming live. Uh, this, this study is brought to you by uh, COVID-19. <laughs> um, I'm still teaching Sunday night, but we're outdoors and I can't control the environment there. And so I'm teaching it again live, which means that I can also give you uh, occasionally a little cat cam. Yes, there's Moxie. She did join us for today. She's quite happy. She's quite content. <laughs> I know this is unlike any Bible study you were expecting if you're a new if you're a new viewer. Um, okay, we're gonna dig right in now. Um, awesome. Okay, so Mark chapter ten. Let's read through the passage verse by verse. Just read through the whole passage. Let me get let me get us there. Mark ten thirty five. And we just want to load the passage in our minds, be, be noticing, just be noticing what's here. We don't want to read our assumptions or, you know, try to answer our questions before understanding the passage. We want to understand the passage and then it will answer our questions naturally. So here we are, uh, Mark 10, 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do, what we, do for us whatever we ask of you, you know, an unnamed request. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, and by the way, that's like a royal status. They want, they want position. That's what they're asking for. This is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this then, the, the 10, the other 10, not James and John, the rest, beca began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I think that this passage, um, it, it sets... The, the whole flavor of what it means to serve in leadership in the body of Christ or to serve in any capacity in the body of Christ. But it's also the thing that is often totally misunderstood and, and just lost. Because as we move into leadership, we start to, to get these CEO mentalities of those who are in leadership. Like, like I'm the, protecting me is basically the ministry, protecting my vision and, and protecting my reputation and that kind of thing. This is completely the opposite of what Jesus is calling us to. So let's dig in. Um, 
overall, this is about, you know, in the context of Mark, and we're going to spend some time on this before we come back to pastoral abuses in a lot of detail, which I will cover that hopefully in a helpful way today. But this is about fixing false expectations and revealing the true mission of the of the Messiah, of Jesus. Jesus is suffering for others. He's not doing what many of the Jews of the time were expecting, which is he's going to kill the Romans. He's going to establish Judy, Judy, uh, not Judaism, but Israel, as like the nation that is that is the head of all the nations of the world and bring in the messianic golden age that will be national prosperity. That's what they're expecting the Messiah to do. Now, there is truth in that, but that's about the second coming and it, and it looks very different than what they were probably expecting. It's actually going to look a lot better and bigger and more grand. But his first coming, his mission is to suffer for others, to serve others, and to give his life that they might gain life. It's not just a more comfortable temporary life, but to give us life. Jesus is coming to save, right? It's that old, uh, boring gospel message, I'm boring to some people, uh, <laughs> that Jesus dies to save you from your sins, to deliver you from the power of Satan, from the power of sin, and to bring you into his kingdom and his love. And our job is to follow in his footsteps. And that includes not only choosing his kingdom over this kingdom, over this world, but also involves self-sacrifice. And this means in pastoral ministry, it involves loving people even when you're bleeding because they have wounded you or you've perceived wounds, whether they're real or not. This is kind of a big deal. And we've got to move past cliche in this. We've got to actually really look at our lives and, and regularly question whether we're having a servanthood mentality because in Christianity, Jesus makes servanthood the highest calling. Servanthood. That's a big deal. Not authority, not exercising authority, but serving others. So let me establish now, we're going to we're gonna do something here. I'm going to teach you a Bible study trick, Bible study technique. It's not so much a trick. This is something you can do on your own. And I think you will find it very rewarding. It takes a bit of time on your part, but it's a very rewarding thing. And basically it's, it's this, you ask one question and you survey through a large portion of scripture, maybe a whole book of the Bible, just trying to look for answers to that one question. So you could do this, like say with, um, with how does Paul understand grace? And you read Romans and your only question as you study Romans is, as you just skim through it, read through it straight through, what is it that Paul's teaching us about grace? And you can gather all these truths about grace. That's a very rewarding method of Bible study. You survey a large portion of scripture, often a whole book, asking one question. And the question we're asking here is, how is it that Jesus is constantly confronting and trying to correct false expectations about the Messiah? This is something he, he does over and over through the Gospel of Mark. And then in this passage, this topic spills over into how we view ourselves as leaders. Because just like they view the Messiah wrongly, they would view their own leadership wrongly. And many leaders in the, in the Christian church today were doing the same thing. We do recognize Jesus as the one who serves, but we don't really take seriously sometimes our call to serve. And if you hear my AC kicking on, it's because it's hot and it's summer and I have it's choices are AC or just me bleeding sweat before you. So here we go. Survey of Mark asking the question, how often, how consistently, and in what ways does God want to change and fix false expectations about the Messiah? Then we'll get to Mark 10 where Jesus fixes false expectations about church leadership. In Mark 1, 8, I'll actually um, take you to these passages myself here. In Mark 1, 8, John the Baptist says about Jesus, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this, again, is, is central to the mission of Christ, but not central in their idea of the mission of Christ, the Jewish expectation of the time. And even modern Jews today are rejecting Jesus because they have often a misunderstanding of what the Messiah is supposed to do. At least they're missing the first coming and those aspects of it. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is like counter to the thinking of the time. Just notice that. It's counter to the thinking of the time. He's going to give me the Holy Spirit. He's going to give me a restored relationship with God where God himself is dwelling within me in, in deep and interpersonal relationship of the most intimate kind. That's what the Messiah is going to do. Nothing to do with Rome. In Mark 1, 11, God speaking of Jesus says, you are my beloved son, my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. 
And, and this is the introduction, God's introduction to the Messiah. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, the first beloved son in the whole Bible is Genesis 22. The first loved son. This is the first time the term is used of, of, of a son. And in Genesis 22, it's Abraham and Isaac. Many of you are familiar with the passage, right? Abraham offers his son Isaac because God commands him to. God, of course, stops him, doesn't let him go through with it. But ultimately, God's just painting a picture of what the father is doing by offering the son for others. This is a beautiful picture. Take now your son, your only son whom you love, God said to Abraham. And here God introduces Jesus as his son whom he is pleased with. This is his beloved, his loved son. I think this is really powerful. Could spend the whole study on this. But what I want you to notice is it's like completely counter to the expectations of the Messiah that they were having at the time. Now, it's, it's consistent with the Old Testament teaching of the Messiah. But their expectations in the Old Testament are not the same thing. And you'll find this as you study modern rabbinic Judaism, that it is not, you know, biblical Judaism. It is not Old Testament Judaism, right? This, there's, it's a version of Judaism that's, that, that grew out of the first, second, third century and has changed somewhat even since then. So it's not really just Old Testament Judaism, which is why we call it rabbinic. Um, all right, in Mark 1.15, we get it again. Look how consistent this is. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, and his call is not, take up arms and get ready to kill the Romans. His, his response is, you know, required response to the people is repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus preaches to repent and believe, not to go kill the Romans. They're not to be warriors. They're to be those who simply repent from their sin and they trust in God. So it's the gospel message being proclaimed. Then Jesus goes on in the Gospel of Mark. We could skim through and you could read stuff that's here, but basically he's doing exorcisms and healings. Note this, Jesus' main enemy is Satan, right? The, it, Satan's the enemy. Demonic powers are those who he is coming against, not Rome. Not a word is uttered of Rome. No attempt on Jesus' part to deal with Rome. He's dealing with Satan in people's lives. And so the Gospel delivers us from the kingdom of this world, the ungodly kingdom of this world, not just a nation, doesn't matter what nation you live in, into the kingdom of God. Also, uh, healings. Jesus, he doesn't destroy, but he delivers. He doesn't kill anyone. He, he raises people. He raises Lazarus. He heals just all kinds of countless people he heals. This is just, now to them, they would have seen this as like evidence that he was the Messiah, but they wouldn't understand that this just was his mission to bring healing and to bring deliverance to the people and it had nothing to do with Rome. In Mark 1, 38, we have another example. Jesus said to him, said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Jesus came to preach. He just came to go around preaching. He didn't come to just like dominate and take over Rome and destroy Rome. But no, he came to teach and preach. This is again counterintuitive. They thought this was maybe a piece of what Messiah was doing. They don't realize it's the center of Jesus's ministry. He wants to preach. Jesus regularly goes on um, and avoids the crowds. As you read on, he'll, he'll have a crowd, he'll, he'll heal a bunch of people, and then he'll just send them away. He'll just dismiss a crowd. He's like, bye. <laughs> and this is not what they expected, right? In the mind of the Jew, they're thinking, hey, we had all these leaders of the past. They gathered and rallied the people of Israel, the tribes from around Israel, and they rallied them for war to go up against whatever oppressing enemy was oppressing them at the time. The Midianites, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, just whoever it was, we're going to deal with those people. But Jesus, he gets a crowd, heals them, feeds them, teaches them, tells them repent and believe, and then he sends them away. This is not like what they were expecting. Right? Ehud, you guys remember Ehud. Ehud is everybody's um, favorite, well, all the guys, all the men out there. This is probably, maybe some of the girls, but this is, for the most part, the guys, your favorite, like, judge from the book of Judges. And Ehud, he, he goes up to King Eglon, and Eglon is, the Bible says, he's very fat. That's the description of Eglon. Ehud hides a sword, and he stabs and kills this man. The sword goes into him, his bowels come out. Ehud then goes, and um, and it's pretty macho. The passage is pretty macho, you know, at least, I, I, I'm, I know people are probably, some people are triggered by me using these terms, but you need to calm down. <laughs> but, uh, but it's pretty macho. He, Ehud's like, I have a message from God for you. And so he, he stabs him. He's like, there's the message. Well, then Ehud goes and he rallies the troops of Israel and they go to war. This is the kind of thing that they may have expected, but they didn't realize the enemy wasn't Rome. It was Satan. The problem wasn't Rome. The problem was sin. That's what Jesus is dealing with. So this is counter to their expectations. 
Jesus, again, reg- he goes on, as you read, he regularly avoids crowds. In Mark chapter 2, verses uh, 10 and 11, he shows that his, his healing of people is specifically to show that he has the power to forgive sin. And this is something you didn't see with the previous judges of Israel and the, and the prototype deliverers, because none of them had the power to forgive. Jesus does. His ministry will be to forgive your sin, not just fight off Rome. So he makes a point of healing someone just to prove that he can forgive, which means the bigger issue is forgiveness, not healing. In Mark 2.10, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And so he heals just to make that point. Now, when you parallel this with the other deliverers, I, I mentioned Ehud, you know, how they went to war after Ehud killed Eglon, or Gideon, how he destroys the idols, and then what's next? War. David, he slays Goliath, and then they know, okay, we can rally behind David. He'll, he'll be God's tool for uh, delivering us from the enemies, the enemies of Israel. Moses, he battles the, Egyptians, the Egyptian magicians and then leads the people out as God judges Israel, uh, excuse me, judges Egypt. So God's bringing judgment on a oppressive nation. That's a consistent thing. In other words, the, the prototype is there's always a battle of kingdoms with these deliverers of Israel. But with Jesus, the deliverance will be from Satan and from sin and from the fall, heal, you know, healing physical diseases and stuff. So it's showing that he's dealing with the ultimate cosmic battle of our broken relationship with God and how that puts us in bondage to sin and Satan. That's the actual thing Jesus is fighting. He constantly fights and deals with this kind of thing. Then he goes to the cross, which comes up soon here in Mark where the ultimate battle is fought and won, but it's fought and won in a way they never were anticipating. Even though the Old Testament predicted it, they didn't expect the Messiah would win by losing. The Messiah would win by dying, by being a sacrifice for our sins, even though Isaiah 53 makes it very clear that's exactly what will happen. So they see Rome, not sin. They see the, the, the battle of Israel and Rome, not the battle of the cosmic things that are going on between man and God and Satan and sin and sickness and the fall. In Mark 2.17... We continue our quick survey here. Um, Jesus shows who he's come for, and he hasn't come for the noble and and the, the, the wonderful and the righteous. Instead, he's come for the opposite, which they weren't expecting. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, Jesus says, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus wants to bring sinners into his kingdom. Now, of course, he also teaches that everyone's a sinner. So when he says not for the righteous, he means the self-righteous, not for those who, who think highly of themselves, but for those who know that they're, they're sinners and they need the Savior. This is just unlike any previous deliverer. He's dealing with the real issues, the root of the issues. In Mark 2.20, we have another example of this. Remember, they expect the beginning of a governmental reign over Israel. This is what they think Messiah is going to do. He's going to get on a throne. This is why James and John asked their question. He's going to get on a throne and reign in Jerusalem any day now, right? As you're following Jesus, any day now. He'll be the king enthroned. Herod's out of here. All these other Herods are gone. Rome's cast off and Jesus is reigning. But in Mark 2.17... He shows, um, or is it Mark, yeah, 2.20, he shows a different approach. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in that day. Why is this significant? Because Jesus is predicting that his reign on the throne isn't going to be happening right now. He's coming to do some other task, some other bigger, better task, and then he'll be taken away from them. This is actually the first prediction in Mark of the death of Christ. I didn't cover it last week when I talked about predictions, but there it is from the lips of Jesus. So the 12 expect to be military leaders, perhaps. The 12 disciples and those following Jesus may expect to be like David's mighty men or like Gideon's 300 or like Barak's ar- army that defeated Sisera's army, although Jael put the final nail in the coffin for Sisera, um, or like the followers of the Maccabees not too long before in the intertestamental period. They expect to be rallied to war. But Jesus gives them a different task. Look at what Jesus tells his disciples they're going to do. So we see Jesus constantly remind you what I'm trying to share. Constantly showing them that their expectations are wrong. They're still not getting it. It took them forever to get it. When they got it, they got it, right? Read about them in Acts, read about them in the epistles, and you're like, they totally get it now, but not yet. In Mark 3.14, it says he appointed the 12, and remember they think we'll be military leaders, and and it's not that. It's so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. So they're just going to go out preaching and fighting Satan fighting demonic powers and and oppression in people's lives, not dealing with Rome. The enemy isn't Rome here. That's the thing. The enemy is the true enemy. Your own sinful nature, your sins, your separation from God, and the oppression and the fall and all those types of things that come. So 
in Mark 3, I'll move a little quicker now because this would take uh, forever, but it's a good forever. Uh, Jesus makes it clear that the enemy that he is here to defeat is Satan. He never utters a single word about Rome. He never talks about casting off Rome. And this may not seem like a big deal. Right? You're, you're post-New Testament Christians. You're like, duh, I know that, Mike. What I'm going to do, though, is ask you to say, let me take these lessons and apply them to leadership in the Christian church. Because we get the wrong idea of leadership. We make it about the wrong kingdom. Then in Mark 4, we have the parable of the sower. I, I won't actually go through the parable of the sower. I think you're familiar with it. I'll just summarize that um, the important issue in the parable of the sower and the soils is not defeating Rome or anything else. It's receiving Jesus' teaching with a good heart and bearing fruit. That's the, that's the big focus for those who hear the teaching. Receive it, believe it, and bear good fruit unto God. What, what's the threat to this? In the soils, we get, we get three bad soils or soils that, that um, obstruct the kingdom of God in their lives. And the first one, it's Satan. Satan's the problem, not Rome, right? In the second one, it's tribulation or persecution, which against their expectations means you as a Christian are probably going to have to face tribulation or persecution for your Christian faith. There's a good chance you will. We shouldn't have a persecution mindset where we pretend things are persecution that aren't, but we need to be ready for those things because they're, they're expected. It's not, in other words, a golden age. Those who receive the message are not entering into a golden age. They're entering into trials. And three, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. That's the third soil. It's, it's got three issues. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things. Ironically, this is kind of what some of the disciples were thinking Jesus was going to give them. He was going to help them with the cares of this world. He was going to help them get rich and wealthy and reign with him. And they had other things they want, which are all expressed in James and John's very natural human desire to be the number two and number three guys next to Jesus. So that's, yeah, the difference is the disciples over here, Jesus over here, their concept of the kingdom, Jesus' concept of the kingdom. In Mark 4, we also have the parable of the seed, which shows the kingdom will grow organically until harvest time, which is not what they were expecting. There's just gonna, we're just going to be preaching the gospel, and it will grow organically throughout the world until a second coming and a harvest time. This was against their expectations for military deliverance. In Mark chapter 6, um, I actually won't go through this passage, but Mark 6, verses 8 through 13, the disciples actually go on a mission without Jesus for the first time. And they don't say, they're not told to preach, get ready, here comes the boom, here comes the deliverance of, 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 of Israel over Rome. Instead, they, they heal, they cast out demons, and they preach repentance and faith, and they just offer a message that is to be believed. Then they leave people, and they're not gathering anybody. Catch how unintuitive this would be for them. They're even walking in obedience, preaching these things, yet still not really fully understanding them. Catch how consistently Jesus is trying to fix their false expectations about the kingdom. This is important. Because as you step into leadership, you naturally, in a carnal sense, you naturally start to want to seek it like it's, it's, it's this earthly kingdom, my kingdom, my focusing it on me. And you can even come up with spiritual excuses to try to make that the case. In Mark chapter 8, we get more. Um, I'll go to Mark 8.29. So Jesus is identified as the Messiah. This is a huge thing for them. But you have to remember, they're, the immediate thing they're thinking is, oh, so we're going to conquer Rome, right? You're the Messiah. Okay, now's the time. Let's rally the troops. We're going to conquer Rome. We're going to have uh, prosperity. We're going we're gonna to have a, a kingdom. But right away, Jesus dispels that. So immediately after Peter says, you are the Christ, Jesus is like, yeah, don't tell anybody. And then he immediately starts saying, and I'm going to suffer and be rejected and be killed, and then rise again. So this is so unintuitive that Peter naturally, because of his confusions about the Messiah, he naturally goes to Jesus and says, no, Jesus, no, no, that can't be the case. Don't say those things. But Jesus, he wants to really focus on getting us to understand. It's not about this world. It's about restore relationship with God and being part of the eternal kingdom. So this is something that's really consistent in the Gospel of Mark. Then Jesus, in the next few verses, shows them what following him is going to be like. If you want to come after me, you, you're not going to, you, you think rule, reign, um, privilege, honor. Well, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You're going to lose your life to save it. This is, this is then contrasted with this world versus the next. You want to gain the world and lose your soul? So Jesus is, has the same focus that Christians and preaching uh, have always had since then guys, get saved. Give your life and heart to Jesus Christ. Focus upon serving in his kingdom. 
But often, even in pastoral ministry, we can start to think with that sort of self-focused kingdom mentality, even in our churches, and it can be very uh, harmful, very harmful, lead to a lot of abuse in the name of Christ, abuse in the name of ministry, abuse in the name of vision and calling and things like that. Then in Mark uh, 8, 38, Jesus foreshadows that there's a second coming. That's when the golden age will happen. For whoever's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with, his holy an- with the holy angels. So here, here they're like, look, the Messiah, is he's here now. He has come. But Jesus speaks about the future coming. That's when all that kind of kingdom stuff will happen. And it will be a kingdom of purified people who uh, can rule and reign with him without carnality, without selfishness, without any of that kind of stuff. In Mark chapter 9, we, as we continue our quick survey, we get the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appear. You know the story. Peter wants to build them tabernacles. Why? Because in Peter's mind and the disciples' minds, they're, they're there to stay. The kingdom is now. It's all going to happen now. But instead, Moses and Elijah are taken back, and God just says to the disciples, this is my beloved son, hear him. Again, that beloved son concept comes in. And this is... Um, this is, this is great. It's, it, when you see that it's a, a shocking contrast between their expectations about their kingdom versus the true kingdom of God in the hearts of men, that's when it, I think the light bulb goes on. In Mark 9.31, he again predicts his death and resurrection. We've, we've dealt with that in detail recently. Um, and they, verse 32 says they don't get it. They still don't get it. And then in Mark 10, 32 through 34, we get a little bit more. And I'm hoping that this will click and you'll never forget as a leader, as those of you who are listening as future leaders even, that you'll never forget these things because carnality and worldliness seeps into leadership and staff meetings and pastoral ministry. It just seeps in over time. So you need a real solid grip on the call to servanthood that God has given us. You can even turn servanthood into an excuse to abuse, abuse people, um, sadly. So James and uh, John... After all this, after Jesus predicts his death and resurrection right here, he, they then go on to say, um, can we sit at your right hand, right? So let's, let's look at the immediate context, and, and you'll see how shocking it is that in response to Jesus, is, Jesus saying this right here in Mark 10, 32 through 34, they then are like, hey, can we uh, rule and reign with you right now? Because they just don't get it. So Mark 10, 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. And it's in that context where John 10, uh, Mark 10.35 comes in. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. So this is like, you're meant to see the irony of it because when you see it in them as being ridiculous, that way you'll see it in yourself as being ridiculous too. When you see it in them as being self-seeking and not understanding the nature of God's kingdom, then you'll see it in yourself. It's the same thing. When you're a leader, when you're serving others, and it becomes about you and your position and your pride and your respectability and your reputation and all that. So um, what do they think they're asking for? Let us, let us sit uh, one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. What do they think they're asking for? Well, th- this is like a, a royal image. Jesus is on a throne and they're sitting next to him on the right and left. So the, the, the picture is them reigning on the two, in the two highest positions in the kingdom of God. Now this isn't even talking about heaven. They're thinking right like maybe a week from now, maybe a year from now, Jesus will be enthroned in Israel, in Jerusalem, and we want to be his right and left hand guys, the two highest positions. This is a trend also in the gospel of Mark, in the gospels, where they're caught regularly or at least more than once. They're caught arguing about which of them is the greatest, which of them is the greatest. Jesus' response to them in Mark 9 was, if anyone wants to be first, he'll be last of all. He's just trying to totally change their perspective. You, you need to stop thinking about your reputation, your status, your greatness. It's just something that doesn't belong in the mind and heart of a Christian. 
So let me uh, give you a bit of an insight here into the way they phrase the question. Um, they ask, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Whatever we ask of you. In other words, Jesus, give us a blank check. We're about to make a request, but we want you to affirm that you'll say yes before we ask. This sounds manipulative because it, it is manipulative. But if you're like, well, why would they do it this way? It's because it's kind of a thing with kings. We, we see this in various places in the scripture. In Esther 5, verse 3, the, the king says to Queen Esther, what is your request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be given to you. Promises up to half the kingdom. Herod in Mark 6.23, earlier in the same book, this is where Herod sw swears to um, uh, Salome, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half my kingdom. Now, when I was first reading the Bible, I remember these phrases up to half my kingdom seeing these phrases, and I was thinking, half the kingdom, that just seems so unrealistic. Like, this just doesn't f fit. Like, who says this? What king is like, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. But really, this is just a magnanimous way of a king showing his glory by bestowing a great favor on someone. He didn't really mean, you know, that if, if she had asked, okay, I'll take the northern half of your kingdom, that he would give her, you know, that half of the kingdom. That's like not gonna happen. Really, it's just a king saying, name a favor, I will grant it. It shows his power, it shows his authority, it it's probably feeds his ego. It's foolish, it's silly to offer, you know, you, you know, people do this to you, right? They go, hey, will you do me a favor? And then you say, yes. And now, you, now you're like locked in, you have, to, you have to do the favor regardless. But Jesus, he's not gonna do this. He's not gonna play that game. In verse 36, what does he say to them? He doesn't say, sure, I'll do it. Instead, he says, what do you want me to do for you? So he's not gonna play that game of, uh, give me, uh, uh, you know, here's a blank check, whatever you ask, you're going to get it. Ironically, this is what some people do in prayer. The, the teaching I've heard in some cases on prayer is that prayer is then a, man, a manipulation tactic, that prayer is a blank promise from God that he'll do whatever you ask as long as you pray in faith. And that's the whole story. Now, there are scriptures that seem to say something like that, but they're not the only scriptures that teach about prayer. We need to take everything the Bible says about prayer. And so their prayer principle is something like, prayer is a blank check, just, just ask. And um, you're doing the same things as James and John here. You're actually interested in your kingdom, not God's kingdom. Your will, ultimately, not God's will. It's interesting to me that the same guys, these guys, James and John, who asked this, one of them, John, wrote an epistle where he actually talked about this exact problem. And so 1 John 5.14 this, this passage is where John, the, the apostle, he actually has learned his lesson. <laughs> He's learned his lesson and he wants you to learn it too. First John 5, 14. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He doesn't see prayer as a blank check where you can get whatever you want, even if it might be carnal, even if you even if it's just against God's will, maybe it's against God's overall plan for your life. And this is the thing that so often prosperity preachers just kind of ignore. Um, they just, they ignore this whole aspect of what God's will is. In fact, I've even heard them teach weird things. You, you probably have too, some of you, where they're actually suggesting that it, it doesn't matter if it's God's will, right? Like you're his child, so of course he wants you to have wonderful things. He's the king and you're his child, so he wants you to have great things. So just ask what you want and whatever you want, you know, he's going to give it to you. But that misses the full teaching on prayer, including this from the same guy, who tried to get a blank check from Jesus in the past, and now he, he knows better. So a yielded heart then, a yielded Christian heart, wants God's will. That's all you do want. I just, I want what God wants. I don't want what I want. That's my heart. My heart in prayer towards God is not, give me a blank check. It's rather, Lord, if it's not your will, I don't want it. Now that can be incredibly hard because sometimes you're praying for things that are not just uh, obviously carnal things. Sometimes you're praying for things that are like deep needs, healing for loved ones, uh, a, a, an infant who's suffering, and you're praying, oh, please, please heal this baby. And, and that's a good prayer, and that persistence in prayer is, is healthy and right and good, and you should persist. But at that point, it can be hard to say, but nevertheless, Lord, your, your will be done, not mine. But that is the heart of prayer. When Jesus taught us how to pray in the Gospels, that's actually part of the, the format for prayer is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will. That's right. Yours, not mine. And so this is just 
ingrained in every Christian's prayer. Yes, Lord, your will be done. Yes, God. And that is a great place of yielding, of a heart that's trusting in God, is when you can say, even though I'm looking at what is going to be a horrific difficulty, if you say no to this prayer, I still trust you, God. I trust your will, and I pray your will be done. That is a powerful thing. I think it's a healthy thing for Christians to have. I think it's something that we need to have ingrained in us, especially those who will um, believe in the real power of prayer, is to also understand God's will matters. Okay, let me talk briefly about a supposed contradiction. I mentioned this before we come back to the issues of, um, of uh, pastoral abuse. And I'm going to kind of hammer on that for a bit. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 and 21, we have the same passage. Remember in the Mark passage, James and John come to Jesus and make a request. But in Matthew, it seems to be recorded very differently. Here it says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that you're in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. Now, the first thing you're going to say is, my some of you would say is this is Mike does anybody really say this is a contradiction because on every video where I've done I have whole videos on supposed contradictions in the Bible and in every video I've done I get comments from from skeptics non-believers who are skeptics of scripture who think the Bible's full of contradictions and they will say things like nobody says that Mike you picked contradictions that nobody says now keep in mind that in those videos I am almost always quoting from skeptic sources I'm quoting from atheist websites but that someone's going to say that Mike does anybody actually say this is a contradiction because everybody, every time someone says that. Uh, but actually on the, the website, the skepticsannotatedbible.com, where they just have a bunch of footnotes, like skeptical footnotes on the Bible, on what they think is wrong with the Bible, on a big list of contradictions, they have this as number 368 as their example of contradictions. And here's what I want you to get. This website makes the case that the Bible is contradicting itself, that this is a true contradiction, and that, that Mark and Matthew can't both be true. They make the case like this. Listen carefully. Who asked for the best seats in heaven? Question mark. That's it. That's the whole case. And in many cases where we see a supposed contradiction being brought up in the Bible, there isn't really a defense. There isn't really a thoughtful, careful, like, let me walk you through why, you know, supposed resolutions aren't going to work. They just say, who asked for the best seats in heaven? They quote Matthew, they quote Mark, the verses I've already read you, and that's it. I also want to point out for those who think maybe the skeptics annotated Bible.com or these websites are good resources is that they don't even understand what the passage is about in the first place, actually. Um, the passage itself isn't about seats in heaven. It's a, they think Jesus is going to physically reign in Jerusalem any day now, and they want the best seats in his earthly kingdom. They don't want just seats, right? They want authority. The seat is an, is, is an illustration of the type of authority and power that they want. So yeah, the skeptics annotated Bible doesn't understand the passage, nor do they defend how this is a, a supposedly unresolvable contradiction. But let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Um, most, I think, are going to naturally look at this and say this is a non-issue. And they would be right. This is a non-issue. We expect an, an amount of flexibility in telling what happened. The gospel writers are not required to quote things verbatim. They are certainly able to summarize stories, to shorten the story. And they have to shorten stories. Every story in there is going to be shortened because you're never going to get all the details in a written account. It doesn't have to be word for word. So this is, this is a summary. It turns out that Matthew just has information that he wants to share in more detail than Mark did. Mark just talks about how James and John came to Jesus. Matthew mentions that it was actually the mother who initiated the request. That's, that's it. Like, I don't, I don't legitimately see how this is even a problem to start with. But I will note this. There are close similarities between Matthew and Mark that I, I think we should point out. For one thing, it says the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and she comes with her sons. So they are. James and John actually are there. This means they're complicit. They're, they're using their mother to try to have more influence with Jesus to get the blank check, you know, request from him, which it doesn't work. So they're complicit in it. So it's fair to say that James and John asked Jesus this thing. Then bowing down, 
she, it says, making a request of him. This is similar to how James and John in Mark, they ask for a favor without specifying it. So she bows down and says, oh, Jesus, may, may I ask you for a favor? Right, with Mark, he says, yeah, James and John were like, do for us whatever we want. And he says to her the same thing he says to James and John. What do you wish? He won't grant the favor, the blank check. Instead, he wants to know what it is they're asking for. Then she says to him the exact same request. Command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. It's the same request. This doesn't imply a contradiction. And as you read on, Jesus answers, and he doesn't answer the mother. He answers the sons. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we're able. So the conversation continues, and it's really Jesus talking to James and John. The mother was just like a pawn being used in this context, and Mark just leaves her out because of that. So what does it mean? If it's not a contradiction, then what are we learning from this? I think we're learning from this that Matthew has independent information from Mark, historically speaking. Right? Matthew didn't get this from reading Mark and going, oh, that's what happened. Rather, Matthew has some kind of information other than Mark, and I would argue because Matthew is a witness of these things. So he shares it this way because that's how it happened. He remembers more details than what Mark has, and he adds some of that in there, and he does that frequently. The Gospel of Matthew does that in a number of places. This means he's not just copying. For those who are skeptics and maybe think that Matthew, Mark, it's just rote copying, there may be times where, where uh, Matthew does copy exactly what Mark wrote, but that's, that's not exactly meaning that there's a, um, that there is no historical source for Matthew's knowledge outside of Mark. Matthew has external knowledge other than Mark that's very clear as you look at Matthew. This is what caused J. Warner Wallace, who wrote a great book uh, called Cold Case Christianity. Um, I think you guys would really enjoy it. You might, might want to check it out. He's a cold case detective. He'd never lost a case. Very successful. The thing about cold case detectives is that their job is to look at old eyewitness testimony, to read the testimony accounts of eyewitnesses you no longer have access to. Perhaps they're dead or maybe they don't remember anymore. It's been 30, 40 years. And so he's reading these things and he compares eyewitness accounts and he wants to see that they're different, but that they're not like in substantial contradiction. And as he was studying, looking to see if the Bible might be true when he was a skeptic, a non-believer, an atheist, one of the things that got him was how the Gospels looked like his multiple eyewitness accounts of real events that he would study when he did his cold case research. Matthew has independent information about this event. That's, that's what that actually means. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, okay, well, back to Mark. Mark 10, 38. Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Again, uh, we note the contrast between their concerns and Jesus. Their concerns, their kingdom. Jesus, he's talking about eternal life, giving us eternal life. The term baptism and cup refer to, baptism refers to his death and the cup refers to the suffering of Christ. Some would use this cup terminology to support uh, penal substitutionary atonement. I don't use this verse for that because he's going to go on to say that they are going to drink the same cup. And so if someone says that cup, this is a side note for the theologian people here, but if you're going to say that that cup is the drinking of the wrath of God, then that conflicts with Jesus saying in the next verse, they are going to drink that cup. So I don't think that that works. Now I do hold to penal substitution. I have a whole series on the topic. I just don't use this verse to support it. And I'm not going to, and I don't recommend you do use verses that, um, Use the wrong verse to support a good doctrine. I don't want to do that. Then they say to him, and the irony of it, right? We're able. Yeah, we're able. But they don't even know what he's talking about. The cup is suffering and the baptism is death. And they're thinking it's going to be ruling and reigning in an earthly kingdom. So totally ironic. Um, Jesus says, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Which means that they are going to suffer. And they are going to even die. This is going to be suffering and pain and difficulty they go through as they follow Christ. The opposite of what they expect. The opposite. Worth it for following Jesus, but not what many expect. Verse 40, but to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Who is Jesus talking about here? Th th this actually I spent some time on because I really don't know the right answer. But I'm going to, uh, rather than avoid the issues that I don't know the right answer on, I'll just... Put it out there for you. Uh, but to sit at my right or my left, this is not mine to give. Who's sitting on his right and left? Is this talking about the thieves, the, the two people on either side of the cross? Or is it talking about the actual coming kingdom, those who sit in the highest 
positions next to Jesus. Who is it talking about here? I'm not really sure. If it's the coming kingdom sitting on his right and left, um, then it does seem to present a challenge for at least the Roman Catholic view, a subtle challenge. This isn't like a huge objection, but the Roman Catholic teaching in the canons, in the supposedly infallible canons of the church, like you can't back off of what's said in the canons. This is something you, you have to affirm, at least if you're going to be consistent as a Roman Catholic. It would say that not only was there a papacy in the first century in the early church, there was actually a papacy during the time of Jesus. You know, Jesus gave the authority over to Peter. And it's not just any old authority, it's papal authority, which is that he effectively has more power than all the other disciples combined. Now, the councils go on to say that this, this type of authority was known publicly to the apostles at the time when Jesus was teaching this. And so here Jesus goes, you know, it's just for those for whom it has been prepared. This doesn't really fit the idea that everyone already knew that Peter was number one. And the following passage that shows that all the ten are upset with James and John, it doesn't reflect this knowledge that everyone knew they're really just trying to usurp Peter's authority. So what I'm saying here is that this, it, it's, um, it doesn't fit to try to read papal authority into the New Testament. It, it just it's just like a square peg in a round hole. And in verse 41, this is their response. Hearing this then, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. And it's important that we recognize this. The, so not only these two are concerned about their own power, the ten are upset because these two want power that would ex exceed the power of the other ten. So everybody's kind of got the wrong point. Everybody's missing the point of Jesus. He's going to try and correct their mentality here. This word indignant is a, is a word that's not used very often in the, in the Gospels. It's used one other time of Jesus in, in an earlier passage in Mark, in Mark 10 actually. Jesus is indignant when they won't allow children to come to him. The irony is that the apostles are indignant not about rejecting those who might come to Jesus. They're indignant about their own authority being threatened. There's a lesson for church leaders. What makes you more upset? One person not being welcomed into the house of God, into the, into the fold, right? Not, not being welcomed because they're considered less or unimportant. Does that make you more indignant? Or does somebody threatening your authority make you indignant? That's a big deal. Shows you what side you're on. It's a good thing to know that Jesus did not call the apostles because of their qualities. They're, they're kind of knuckleheads in a lot of places in the Bible. And not because they were more of a knucklehead than anybody else, but because the knuckleheads is who God has to work with. But I take it as an encouragement, as hope for me and hope for you, that God uses the weak things of the world to shame the wise. That God often raises up and uses in leadership and in ministry those who would not in and of themselves find themselves qualified. But by the work of the Spirit, they are. That's pretty awesome. Now, the rebuke that follows, and what we want to focus on for the rest of our time, is not for the two, it's for the twelve. That's important to know. It's for all of them. So it's not just James and John that are going to be rebuked or corrected for having a self-centered authoritarian view. It is also all of the 12. They're all going to be corrected here. So let's read it now. Verse 42. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. That's one symptom of, of typical rulers in the world. They lord it over other people. And their great men exercise authority over over them. That's just what you do when you're in leadership. You're the boss. You're the one. I have authority. This is, this is my, my focus is my own power over others. But he says, it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all, which is not a prestigious role in any way, shape, or form. Be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So those in leadership, if I can harp on leadership for a bit. Now, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor, uh, I guess, officially since 2006. And I've been in ministry for years before that. And I have noticed that those in leadership sometimes learn bad habits. And those bad habits and ungodly attitudes are sometimes rewarded by the other people around them. And those bad habits and bad attitudes can sometimes become instilled, institutionalized 
in a local church. And I like to talk about that. One of the problems that James and John had that pastors today can get is self-promotion. Self-promotion. So let me talk about self-promotion. One symptom of it is this. Let's say you're at church and you're in a staff meeting. I've been in lots and lots of staff meetings. So many meetings, so many meetings. Man, I, can't, I don't like meetings that much. <laughs> I avoid them. Um, but in staff meetings, there's this time where you go around the room and you're reporting in on how your ministry is doing and how things are going. And this is a time where you can sometimes see if the symptom of self-promotion is creeping into the body of the church through the leaders. Because those guys can sometimes, instead of saying, here's what's really going on in my ministry, it can be all about trying to make themselves look good in that meeting. This is bad. This is dangerous. Like this may seem like a subtle thing, but I think that this is actually very dangerous. And so at least I try to make it a habit when I was in staff meetings. And I'm not, thank God, having to go to staff meetings all the time anymore. But when I was in regular staff meetings, I'd try to be like, let me just front load. Yeah, things are, things are rough right now. We're having this problem or that problem. And I would try to just put it out there, even though I knew it would be kind of embarrassing or it might make me look bad because I realized there was a sinful temptation to self-promote. And the sad thing is that self-promotion actually works. Guys that only speak positively about themselves, like I've even seen pastors do it on, from the pulpit where they talk about all their great adventures and all the things they've done right. And there's a time where you should use your own life as an example, as a positive example, but there's a sinful temptation to turn this into a self-promotion thing where on, I become the superhero Christian because I'm just always promoting myself. Um, even even now with, with online stuff, when people are sending me like a thing, hey, Mike, you want to come and do this or you want to come a guest on this show or something like that, that it's the way they present themselves, it's very tempting to want to try to put your best foot forward. And that... It's better to lose an opportunity and to not fall into the temptation to become a self-promoter. It's very unhealthy and it will affect the church in a lot of negative ways because now it's about you and how you look instead of ministering to God's people and blessing the sheep and being accountable. And it, 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 it guts the ministry of its function and purpose and centers it around you instead of the body. Self-protection. Let's talk about that for a second. Self-protection is something else that happens in the church and Jesus obviously is not interested in that. I mean, look at his example. He doesn't protect himself. He goes and he gets crucified for your sins. And then he says, that's the example for leadership that I want you guys to follow. That's what he's trying to tell them. The son of man doesn't come to serve, but to be served. Uh, excuse me, doesn't come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. That's a model for leadership. I am here to bless others even when it hurts me, even when it wounds me. And, and I think pastors need to hear this because you get wounded in leadership. You get wounded. I get wounded in leadership. There's times where I've just been like, Lord, I've, I've, I've got to pray because I'm feeling upset, angry, even bitter towards people in the congregation that are wounding me. Help me because I can't obsess about protecting myself. I need to just take these wounds and just let you heal them and not go and lash out on people, on others or else I'll be the one causing the wounds. I'll be the source of the wounds instead of the source of the healing for others. So self-protection is, is a problem and it gets institutionalized in churches. And sometimes the, the phraseology of it is protecting the vision, protecting the vision, or even protecting the pastor. I know there's structures in churches where a pastor, he, he will never confront anybody. He only sends someone else to be the guy. And he's the official bad guy for the church where the pastor will say, distance me from this, but I want you to go and deal with them. Um, or he'll be like, I'll say the board made that decision even though I really made it because I don't want people to think negatively of me. There's an element of this which I partially understand because you're trying to make sure they can still be ministered to you from the pulpit even after getting bad news. But there's another side where you're just protecting the man and you're not protecting the sheep. That's problematic. And if the theme, if, if like the overarching rule for ministry is, is protect the vision by which we really mean protect the reputation of the leader, like the central superman of the church, that's ungodly and that is not the calling of leadership. And it has to be from the top down. We have to see that not happening. This affects decisions because we can harm people in the name of Christ. We can hurt others. Those who might have a true and sincere and right beef with a pastor or leader in the church 
can be treated the worst because they're seen not as somebody who has a legitimate complaint or even might have a legitimate complaint, but they're seen instead as a threat to the rank, reputation, and authority of the chosen leaders. And, and this, we, we just can't do this, right? Like, it, it, you know, yes, it's true. Ignore an accusation if it's not brought by two or three witnesses. But what if it is? What if there's like two or three people that are saying like, the pastor's being, you know, he's being mean. He's just being rude to people, mean to people, inconsiderate. And then it needs to be dealt with and honestly dealt with. And protecting the pastor here can't be an excuse for ungodliness that we, that we spill out into the church. We can harm people in the name of Christ because we think we're protecting the church when we're really just protecting the reputation of one person. I think this one rule, we've come to serve and we should follow Jesus even if it means we're the sacrifice. I'm the one who will be suffering in, in my efforts of serving others. I think that one rule, it stops pastoral abuse. Because that means, as a pastor, and I've, and I've been confronted with opportunities to do this, um, and it hurts, it is not fun, to sacrifice my reputation, my position, my power, in order to serve others. Because preserving me is not the ministry. Preserving me is not the ministry. That's humbling. When I look at the sheep, I just have to honestly say, I'm just one of you trying to serve you. I'm not the best of you. I'm not, you know, there's these, you know something's wrong if in the church, the pastor has to be the best at everything, right? The pastor is, he's the smartest. He's the best. Whatever job you do, he could do it better if he wanted to. And this mentality that sometimes seeps into the churches, this is not healthy. And it will cause a lot of problems. I'll, let me tell you a story. True story. When I was in the School of Ministry over at uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, uh, which was, I, I think, a fantastic program, radically helped me a lot. It's, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. So <laughs> if you want to, they have something called the School of Ministry. It's not the same program at all. I don't really know that much about it. But um, it was fantastic. Carl Westerlin did it. He was, he was amazing. I so appreciate him. But when I was in that program, we would have on Fridays a missionary or a pastor come to share, and they would share stories or they would share some of their experiences. And it was very encouraging and edifying and, and very helpful. One pastor in particular, I will never forget. He was the worst guest we ever had. He was, he was like, but I'm so grateful because his story was so bad that it just opened my eyes and made me never forget this problem. So here's the story he told. And he had been hurt in his church and he was carrying that hurt with him. It wasn't resolved uh, by going to God, by praying, by seeking the Lord. It was being carried with him and that, that will bleed out onto people and it's bad as a leader. But here's what happened. He says, according to him, he went on vacation. And while he's on vacation, he had his youth pastor teaching in the sanctuary for him. And when he came back from vacation, he asked the congregants, how was it while I was gone? And one particular congregant, I guess he heard from lots of people, the youth pastor did a fantastic job. It was like a great, great Sunday. He had a great message. And one lady in particular was just, just thrilled and excited about how good it was. Oh, he did so good. It was such a blessing, pastor. He was so wonderful. You should have him speak more often. And this pastor heard all of it from the wrong kingdom mentality, right? From his kingdom. He heard it all from that perspective. So what he hears is something like, you're inadequate, you're not doing a good enough job, which for all I know could be true. Scarily and sadly enough, could be true or not. But that's what he hears. And so he turned to the lady and in his own words, as he's telling us the story, he says to her, what about me? What about me? I've been preaching and teaching for years faithfully, but what about me? You never say all these things about me. And I'm just sitting there in, in the school, in the class, and I'm like, who is this guy? I don't remember his name, fortunately. <laughs> um, but I'm like, who is this guy? What is wrong with this guy? He should be thrilled. You, have, you, you should let this pastor teach more. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Oh, he's having a tremendous blessing on the body. I see that as a personal threat to me. He continues the story. He says that that pastor was then causing division and causing and gathering people after himself and he eventually had to fire him because of it. I doubt that that's true. My honest feeling is that he saw people who liked that other guy's teaching as a personal threat to him that had nothing to do with serving Christ, nothing to do with building up the body of Jesus. And so in his effort to protect the vision, protect the church, he actually cut off what was probably a wonderful servant of God, fired the guy. Now, to make matters worse, in our school of ministry, 
one student raised his hand during because we do Q&A time after the guy shares. He raised his hand and he says, so, you know, in the future, if I'm a pastor and I'm selecting people for church leadership, you've obviously had a lot of problems with church leadership. What do you think are the number one? What's the number one quality? What's the most important thing to look for in those who you serve with? And I want you to meditate on that for a second. What would you say is the most important thing to look for in people if you were hiring someone to serve alongside you in ministry? What's the most important thing to look for? Most important thing to look for, right? I think my answer is going to be godliness, godly character. As I look at the the requirements for leadership, most of them are about godly character. Humility, teachability, compassion, um, how they, what do they do when they're angry? They can't be a man prone to anger. Um, boasting, all that kind of stuff. What, what is what is the requirement? He responds very quickly and says, oh, easy, loyalty. Loyalty is the most important thing. This, this is a man serving in the church and he has the mentality of James and John when they're asking Jesus to make him on the right and left. Not the mentality of James and John after the resurrection when they got it. They ha- he has the carnal self-preservation, self-promotion, self-interest He can't see the difference between his glory and the good of the church. That's pastoral abuse. I'll never forget that horrible example of a pastor. I'm glad I don't remember his name (laughs) because someone's going to ask. Hopefully he's changed. Hopefully he's grown. Hopefully he looks back at some point and says, man, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? I think this one rule, serving, blessing others, putting others first, I'm here to serve others, and my position is not the most important thing. If this means I get demoted because somebody else is doing it better, praise God. I hope that those who come alongside do it better than me. They're not a threat. They're a blessing to the body of Jesus Christ. I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve. But it's not just church leaders. It can affect you too. Because in your own life, you, you're, you can be interested in self-promotion, self-protection, and self-interest. You can be just as bad. Maybe you don't have pastoral authority, but you have some other authority as a parent, as the oldest sibling, as, a, as a, an, empl- an employer or maybe a manager. You have some authority in some spectrum. Uh, you know, as a teacher in school, you have authority in your class. How you engage in your authority, is it like James and John were thinking, or is it like Jesus who says, serve, don't be served, Offer yourself, suffer even for the blessing you can bring to other people. It's not about you. Philippians 2 has a a word on this. It says, do nothing, nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard another, one another as more important than yourselves. Leaders have to do this more than anybody, but we all are supposed to do it. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests and don't pretend that the interest of the church is basically your interests, but also for the interests of others, right? Then it tells us again to have the attitude. This is the same thing Jesus was teaching the disciples, have the attitude which was in Christ Jesus, um, who with all of his rank and authority, he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Instead, what does he do? He empties himself, takes the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearances of many, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which to them was the most embarrassing form of death there was. And you're called, you're called to follow in his footsteps. Let's look real quick at Mark 10, 42. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Not among you. So Christian leader, have a new value system. Beware worldliness. You're not a CEO. I mean, I've heard, I've seen it happen. I don't know if I can describe it well, but I've seen it happen where a, a person serving in ministry, they, they just carry this egotism and self-interest with them into the ministry. And they say things like, oh, well, the pastor's job is kind of like a CEO. Well, maybe there's an element of that where there's some kind of truth there. But I've seen that be the excuse for bad leadership in the past as well. The world is not our model. Jesus specifically warns Christian leaders, it is not this way among you. You can't have this authority-centered way of thinking. It can't be that way. You've got to be Jesus-centered, man. You suffer and sacrifice and serve. That's it. Because you're following Jesus who did the very same thing. Even those who wound you, you still serve. 
It's not about protecting yourself. It's about serving others. Yes, it's a high call. This is taking up your cross. But whoever wishes to become great among you, Jesus goes on, shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. So greatness is serving. It's not a means to an end. I'm not serving to get great. I don't become the, the youth pastor so that I can try to become a senior pastor because that's the higher, better position. You know that's wrong, right? But yet I've seen those in leadership who've talked behind the scenes where sometimes I realize this person person's being driven by selfish ambitions, not serving the body. Like I just, to be organic, just serve, bless as best you can. You'll find your gifts naturally. And then those gifts will lead you into other ministries, not so you can have higher rank, but so where you can best serve because it's according to the gifts you've been given. Rank is, has nothing to do with it. It shouldn't be in our considerations at all. One way to test this is if you're content in serving without being recognized, right? When nobody thanks you for your service, you may find out why you're doing it. That's, that's a, a big indicator. Nobody thanks you, nobody acknowledges, acknowledges it. And uh, how do you feel about that? <laughs> it could be, a, could be a good thing. Then in verse, at the end of 40, 43, um, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. So you want to be the slave. Slave of all. Godliness with contentment in leadership is being content with not being recognized, with not getting more status, with, with sometimes being the target of right or wrongful accusations. That will happen. Satan wants to attack and undermine the leadership of churches. I think that happens a lot. And I think that pastors just have to have, leaders just have to have a, a right understanding of what they're supposed to do in response to this, which is you don't defend yourself. You don't go around trying to um, ruin the reputation of those who are, who are speaking about you behind your back. Your goal isn't to then use your public influence to ruin their reputation and to harm them. No, you, you take it on the chin and you keep serving. And you ask, is there anything I can learn from this? Let me learn from it. If not, Lord, I just pray that you'd help me with it because I, I can't go around defending myself lest I make this ministry about my reputation and uh, bring in ungodliness. How many of church leaders started by serving the Lord? I just want to serve and do anything I can for the Lord. And slowly it turned into a concern for status where it wasn't about serving, but maybe it was about you getting more recognition, higher status. I think this kind of thing plagues leaders, the desire for better status. But Jesus tries to protect us. In verse 45, he gives us the ultimate answer to all these problems. Even the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's literally what Jesus did. And he's always our example. Uh, we sometimes forget to have him in our minds each day. Uh, in, in church, yes, but also at work, at home, as a parent, as a, as a son or daughter, in whatever relationship you've got, like this mentality of I am here to serve others. This is, this is what makes a, a Christian glorious wherever they are, is I'm here to bless others and serve them. It's not about me. And it gets, you know, your insecurities, which I, I'm very familiar with insecurities. I happen to have a boatload of my own. But your insecurities will always influence you away from this attitude of servanthood. But the example of Jesus will draw you back in. Follow him and serve. It should impact us all the time. Now, I um, talked to a, a friend earlier today who was talking about uh, her own story where there was a lot of pastoral abuse. And what she had done was uh, brought together several verses that talked about some of the character qualities that we should see in Christians and in leaders in particular. And I'm just going to read to you the list that she provided, which I thought was, was well done. If, if you think your leadership or yourself as a leader might be affected by this abusive mentality, by, by seeking your kingdom instead of God's kingdom, by, by uh, delighting in your authority and abusing your rank and ruling it over others instead of serving, I think this list is great for you. So here are some things that leaders and all Christians should have. Uh, they, must, um, there we go. they must not be arrogant or prideful. 1 Timothy 3.6, Titus 1.7, 2 Timothy 3.4. They must not be arrogant or prideful. Here is a qualification that is a disqualification as a leader. You're arrogant. Now, in the world, arrogant and prideful people naturally rise to leadership. But in the church, it should not be that way. Character matters more than their ability to teach from a pulpit. It doesn't matter how great your experience was when they got up on stage if their life isn't exampling humility and godliness offstage. They must not be a self-promoter or a lover of self, 2 Timothy 3, 2. 
So self-promotion, though it works, should actually repel a godly body or a godly board of elders, leaders in the church who are deciding who they're going to promote, while the one who promotes themselves shouldn't be promoted. They should not be domineering or bullying, um, and they don't shouldn't need control over others or to drive out those who disagree with them. That's 3 John 1, 9, and 10. There's only one chapter in 3 John. So 3 John verses 9 and 10. And that is to drive out and control, influence others so that they're pushed away so that eventually the, the man is surrounded by a bunch of loyal minions and yes men. That is not a need for a godly leader. They shouldn't have a critical spirit or abusive speech or brutality when they deal with others. That's right. They shouldn't have that critical spirit, abusive speech, brutality in dealing with others. First Timothy 3.3, 3, Titus 1.7, 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 3. The point here is that sometimes pastors feel that they're in a spiritually right, like um, I'm right about this issue, and then they're wrong about how they deal with the issue. And so they can be abusive, harsh, cruel towards others, and it just becomes part of the way they do ministry. Um, basically, they're a jerk. Can I just summarize? Like they shouldn't be a jerk. They should graciously and thoughtfully and carefully try to educate and bring others alongside. There's a time for hard words. But too many guys, they get their, their vision of pastoral leadership from like cowboy movies, you know, from the 70s. And, and some of those movies are fun, but those guys are often arrogant jerks. And so these are not my model for what Christian leadership should look like. Um, they should not have outbursts of anger, be quick-tempered. Uh, they shouldn't have be quarrelsome. Right? They shouldn't be the kind of guy who just argues a lot and gets into a lot of arguments and dissent. Dis, uh, what's the term we're looking for here? Divisive conversations. That's not the kind of person they are. If they're quick-tempered, they're disqualified as leaders. First Timothy 3.3 3 and Titus 1.7. They need to fix that problem. They should not be vindictive or unwilling to seek forgiveness for the wrongs they've done. That's 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. If, if a leader can't be corrected, if they can't be corrected, then they ought not be propped up. Now, I'm speaking here to those who are making decisions about leadership. They have to be teachable. They have to be corrected. Here's the thought. If you're a senior pastor, go and sit with those who should be able to correct you. By the way, if you're a senior pastor who says, I have a list of people who can correct me anytime they want, but that list is like a secret group of people who don't go to your church and they can speak into your life, but nobody who's actually in your fellowship can speak into your life. Like That is actually a way of protecting yourself from correction. That's not healthy. Go and ask those you serve with who, who are regular, like they're, el they're elders in the church effectively, right? At least functionally, whether you call them that or not. Ask them very honestly, do you feel, this is a great question, do you feel that you can, you can correct me if you think that I'm in error and that I will be open to correction? That is a fantastic thing for you to ask them. Don't do it as a test for them. Do it as a test for you because you may have unintentionally created an environment where nobody can correct you because they fear the way you react when they try to. Also, they should not make misleading statements or manipulate, manipulate to divert attention away from, uh, away from the issues that they have. And so um, 2 Corinthians 4.2 is the, the text that she uses for that. And I, I think, yeah, yeah, don't be, obviously don't be liars, don't be deceivers, but, but also don't accuse others every time they bring you a problem. You just accuse them. Oh, you think, you think I have a problem? Here's your problem. Like that, that mentality is a, is a way of blocking growth. They should not use flattery or gifts to gain favor, 1 Thessalonians 2.5. They shouldn't be a respecter of persons favoring the talented, rich, famous, or powerful, James 2.9. They should not have a bad reputation with those outside the church. That is, unbelievers think they're good Christians too, 1 Timothy 3.7. Um, and, uh, and of course, they have to have that, that whole you know, biblical grounding, be able to teach doctrine and explain the Christian faith and defend it correctly and all that. I think that those are some interesting things uh, to share. I hope that this has helped. Look, if, if you find yourself in a position where you're in a church and you think it's abusive, this doesn't mean like you just have to immediately get out of Dodge. First step is this, just recognize that that's not the model for leadership and seek at least in the next generation to help influence godly leadership that will not be plagued with the same issues if you can't change the leaders that are currently there. Second, perhaps you, you should confront your leaders if you, if you need to do so with grace and compassion, do so with a lot of thought. Maybe a written letter is better. Maybe you need to do it with, with one or two people with you so that conversation isn't totally private because that could come back to bite you. And, um, uh, and, and maybe, um, maybe you have to leave because you're just in a very abusive congregation or very abusive leadership structure. 
and you're like, it's just, it's so bad. I just, I've, I've got to go somewhere else. And I, I think that there's a time to do that. May God give you wisdom. It's a hard, I'm very slow to leave a church, but there are times where it, it is a, it is a wise thing. Um, although most of the time it's not. I don't want to do this to stir up and, and, and encourage dissension and division. I think we want to have grace and compassion towards our leaders, but we want to hold up the standard that Jesus set of a serving, self-sacrificing leader and realize this is what I'm to emulate. That even when I'm bleeding because the congregation or the people have hurt me, I still serve and I still do it in love. That's kind of a big deal. All right, guys, this has been the uh, the Mark series part 39. Next week, we're going to pick up part 40. We do, we're doing this, I think, you know, Monday or Tuesday. I'm, I'm, the live streams are a little bit inconsistent. So if you want to be watching these videos as they go live, you're going to need to make sure you're subscribed, that you have the bell thing clicked. Um, also, you have to like make sure that on your phone or on your cell phone, notifications are enabled so that like when YouTube sends notifications, you actually see them. That's just for those who are interested in having them live. They'll always be up on my channel as well. And I appreciate you joining me. Later this week, I have some more video content coming out. And I'll probably do another live Q&A later in the week. Watch my channel for uh, the input on that. And I'd love to take your guys' questions on this topic or anything else. Um, if, you know, anything I can do to hopefully serve you um, and be a blessing to you. My hope is that for any pastor who watches this, any leader who watches this, where some of that ungodliness has come into your thinking, that you will, you will not just forget the message you just heard. You will... You will be in prayer and you'll be broken over it until you have a Christ-like mentality towards the service you bring to others. God bless you.